Hey everybody, you know I wanted to use this opportunity to talk about uh, something that happened this weekend. I, as you may know, have a blog on Pathios called Messy Inspirations. Check it out if you haven't already. Messy Inspirations at Pathios. And this past weekend was the uh, the Sunday's Gospel was the Parable of the Talents, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. And so I posted about that uh, going into the cultural context. Uh, incidentally, in this uh, Bible Alive YouTube channel, there is a whole playlist on the parables of Jesus talking about the five most difficult parables of Jesus. And the fifth parable we deal with, at some length, is the parable of the talents. It's been up since 2017. I invite you to go check it out, look into it. It, it goes into this in far more detail. But anyway, in a condensed version of that, I presented in my uh, Pathios blog, a breakdown of Sunday's Gospel, Matthew chapter 25, 14 to 30, the parable of the talents. And apparently it was so disturbing to a number of readers, which is good, by the way, you know. I offended so many people. I offended also a fellow blogger who decided to call me out on the Pathios Facebook page, claiming that I uh, completely misunderstood and misrepresented the parable. And he next proceeded to present a very typical allegory gone wild treatment of the passage. If you go to my YouTube playlist on the parables, you'll see I talk a lot about allegory gone wild. Uh, I'm indebted to Dr. Richard Rohrbaugh of the Context Group of Biblical Scholars, who just masterfully shows that tendency in church history. Sir uh, the fathers that are Syriac, Western, Greek, they tend to allegorize wildly. And Jesus didn't tell allegories. But anyway, I'm getting away from that. This blogger was extremely offended because I referred to the master in the parable as a douche. He implied that I was saying that God was a douche. I didn't call God a douche. I called the master a douche because he was. The master is not God, but it's popularly understood that the master must represent God. Well, let me tell you something, folks. If the master in the parable of the talents represents God, who needs the devil? If the master in the parable of the talents, or the Luke conversion of the coins, represents God, who needs the devil? Almost every Catholic I know would benefit from a solid course on Jesus' parable. So I encourage you to go through the lessons laid out in the playlist I just mentioned, particularly for the parable of the talents and the coins, and get a refresher there on the difference between parables and allegories. Because very few Catholics I know, very few Christians I know, can really distinguish and understand that parables are not allegories. And what the early church did, including the writers of Gospels, is turn Jesus' parables. Jesus didn't tell allegories. They, the evangelists turned the parables into allegories. And the allegorizing kept on going after the written Gospels. Anyway, I'm going to try to keep this video short and sweet. Again, I'm going to be following the insights of Dr. Richard Rohrbaugh here, Context Group Biblical Scholar. My fellow blogger, Sir Rejoinder, rests on his unproven presumption that the master who reaps where he did not sow and gathers where he scattered no seed is in fact God. So I'm going to try to keep my focus here on the master while touching on a few other elements. I know if you've been to any homily about this parable, I'm not psychic, but I can guarantee that the homilist almost assuredly identified the master with God. And this is a problem because there's no textual support for that. To say that he's God is to say that this man must be honorable, because why would you describe God as an Israelite like Jesus? Why would you be describing God, the Father, as somebody dishonorable, somebody reprehensible, somebody a reprobate? But that's the problem, is that the master is a scumbag. So we have to ask the question, if we're going to call the master God, or an analog for God, we have to ask, what is the only possible way that the master could be viewed as honorable? And that such a parable as the parable of the talents, or in Luke, the parable of the coins, could be seen as good news, as gospel. Answer, only if the storyteller, Jesus, and his audience were wealthy and held the greedy rich vantage point and value system of greedy elites in the first century. Because only greedy elites would listen to that parable and deem that the master was a good man and that the parable is good news. Therefore, to estimate the master as righteous and honorable and the story as gospel, good news, demands that both storyteller and audience wield coercive force and use it to extract what rightfully belonged to peasants for themselves.
Consequently, if this were so, Jesus the storyteller and his audience would be the very opposite of what the sage Ben Sirah praises in Sirach chapter 31 verses 8 to 11. It's very ironic that Western interpreters, American Christians among them, including U.S. Catholics, overwhelmingly assume that the master is an honest person and that his actions in the parable are entirely justified. Dr. Richard Warbaugh wonders what could possibly bring gospel readers to this conclusion. Is it narrative logic that leads readers to assume that, nudging them along the way so that they will adopt this viewpoint of the master? Think of him positively? Dr. Rohrbaugh offers a far more likely scenario. Western acculturation does this. As Rohrbaugh and other context group scholars stress, Jesus is not an American. We've talked about this a lot on this YouTube channel. Rohrbaugh cautions us against any Jesus we might concoct in our heads who is congenial to American values. Therefore, we must also beware any and all Gospels congenial to American cultural values also. So when I'm reading the Gospels, right, I'm looking at a story I think I understand. Is it tickling my American ear? If so, it probably ain't the real Jesus. Because Jesus, the real Jesus, was a starving Galilean peasant artisan. Speaking to mostly fellow starving Galilean peasants. And their world, folks, was a limited good world. Think of a pizza pie. And that's all there is. And there's only so much to go around. And if you come in as an a-hole, like this master, and the two so-called heroic faithful servants, and you s take a slice for yourself, Bigger than what you are owed, you are robbing from the rest. Because all the goods in the world were given at creation, they were distributed, and there is simply no more to come. That's the principle of the limited good. The world they have is a zero-sum game. You get something, somebody else had it taken from them. If it's extra, it's extra. You get something surplus to what you need, and what is your right, you have robbed from someone else. Therefore, Jesus and friends would view any master receiving a thousand percent, that's what he gets in this story, a thousand percent on his money as despicably shameful and greedy. Ultimately, Jesus would call this guy a fool like, the, like he does to the farmer in the Lucan story, Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 21, who stores up all of his surplus instead of being a patron and sharing the surplus with the needy, he stores it up and then God, Jesus calls him a fool. And he, he is a fool. God takes his life. In Jesus' day, who could see this parable of the talents, Matthew 25, 14, 30, or its variant, the parable of the coins, Luke chapter 19, verses 12 to 27, as good news? Who would say, oh sure, it's obvious that the master is symbolically standing in for God. He's an analog for God. Look carefully at the master. He's ruthless. He's a shameless elite, guilty of usury. He lays out his money to the vile money lenders and agents who were not trusted in the first century world, folks. The scales were all rigged. He threatens and interrogates his slaves and scrutinizes the ledgers. This is a stand-in for the God of Israel? What a disrespectful way of portraying God. I mean, with such a God, who needs the devil? And how can this be the gospel or the good news? Would, would this be good news to peasants, to Jesus' peasant audience? 80 to 90% of his audience would be peasants, starving peasants. Many of them would have had their lands cheated from them in the kangaroo courts controlled by the elites and their retainers. Elites like this master. Is that the gospel? No, thank you. I don't want that gospel. If I'm a peasant in the first century, I don't need that gospel. Who needs such a wretched God and bad news like this? And then if you look at the supposed saints or holy men of the story, these would be slaves number one and two, you know, who, who take what the master gave him and double the money, you know, and, and they, they make it more. How could Jesus or his peasant listeners ever think of these two reprobates as heroes? While they both may seem venturesome and industrious to us, go, 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 do, do, do Americans, don't forget, these are characters from a Middle Eastern peasant story. And inspiration happens in, folks, 
You have to ask yourself, how would Galilean peasants, ardently believing in the limited good, ever be convinced that these two were heroes, or holy people? The only people who could see this sorry pair as heroes or saints would be wicked folks themselves. Admirers of these two slaves would believe it right to amass wealth by contriving to get a more extensive and therefore unjust share of the limited pie of goods, thereby stealing from the poor. In other words, only a first century a-hole, greedy SOB, like the master, would think these two characters righteous and honorable. And who in Jesus' day would imagine the poor third slave, the one who added nothing, the one who buried his talent in the ground, as wicked? Only people with a greedy elitist mentality. Certainly not peasants like Jesus and the majority of his audience. But go to any Western sermon or homily, any preacher or priest from the West, and you will hear nothing but condemnation of the third slave. The universal cry is, he's a failure. By the way, here's variations in this, and it's important to see the variations, because that suggests that the versions we are getting, even though we call them inspired, which is fine, have definitely been recontextualized and evolved from the version Jesus actually told somewhere in the Galilee, maybe the year 29. To Jesus and his fellow peasants in year 29, the world was very different than ours. They believed that no human power could increase the size of the limited good pie. The world was given its goods, distributed evenly and justly by God in creation, and there's no more to come. If there's anything going to come, it's a renewal, not more pie. And they also thought that the rich, who did not share their surplus, like stewards and patrons think the Godfather movies, were greedy thieves without mercy. They believed that an honorable man only sought out what was already his by right and no more. I want you to think about it, my friends. To a Galilean peasant, this parable would have been a tale of terror. How could they accept that it was a description of the kingdom of God? If that were so, then this parable would have confirmed the worst nightmares of Jesus' peasant audience. Because that would mean that God and his reign, the reign of God, the kingdom of God, worked precisely as did their daily experience. In other words, the powerful and the greedy take advantage and destroy the weak and get rewarded for it because God is no different. He's just like the rich, wealthy elites. American Catholics, please carefully examine the actions of the third slave. He buries his master's talent for safekeeping. According to peasants like Jesus and the vast majority of his listeners, this is precisely what an honorable person ought to do. Commenting on Exodus 22 verse 7, guess what the first century source Josephus Flavius says happens to a depositary should he lose the smallest portion of a deposit? That means he has to face a tribunal with seven judges and swear oaths that he has neither used any of it nor lost it through any malice or intent. Going back to the story, what does the third slave do? He follows to the letter what would become later rabbinic law. He buries it in the ground. This is the proper honorable course of action. Rabbis would later rule that somebody bearing an entrusted amount was not responsible for any loss. So if it got lost, well, he buried it in the ground. It's like an act of God. He didn't do something with it dishonorable, like taking it to twisted markets and banks and commit the sin of usury to increase it. We have to not forget that the third slave acknowledges that he's very afraid. Luke says specifically, he's afraid of the master. Why? The master is said to be a very hard man. The Greek term in Matthew means harsh or cruel or merciless. In Luke, the term means strict or exacting. In either case, we get a picture of exactly the kind of greedy person described by the ancient Plutarch, one who constantly interrogates slaves and inspects the ledgers with an eye only for his own profit. Moreover, we are told that he reaps where he did not sow and gathers where he did not scatter seed. My friends, what could be a better description of a crook? This man is simply a thief, or in the biblical understanding, a greedy, rich person who does not share his surplus. Folks, this evil master in the story isn't God. He's not an analog for God. 
He's just a greedy Mediterranean son of a bitch, the type that Plutarch describes, someone who continually interrogates slaves, scrutinizes the ledgers only with profit as his sole concern. This is a ruthless person, 